Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Join host Sanjay Puri as he explores the dynamic and developing world of artificial intelligence governance. Each episode features deep dives with global leaders at the forefront of regulating AI responsibly, tackling the challenges using AI can bring about head on and enabling balance without hindering innovation. Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Artificial intelligence, AI stands at the forefront of technological evolution, with experts predicting that it could add trillions of dollars to our GDP, but it could also negatively impact our workforce and national security. So how do we regulate it without stifling innovation? Our podcast features insights from different perspectives. We have had industry leaders, government officials, to advocacy group leaders. Together, they address pivotal questions that are needed to create practical legislation. I'm very excited to have Professor Ronald Arkin with us today. Professor Arkin is a professor emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I invited him on this show as it's very important to get different perspectives towards framing AI legislation. And we wanted to get a perspective from a robotics and a robo-ethics expert. Welcome, Professor Arkin. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Regulating AI podcast. Thank you, Sanjay. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me and letting my voice be heard in this forum. Well, it's a very important voice, uh, uh, Professor. So let's dive uh, into some of the things uh, that really need to be addressed. So, uh, Professor, how can uh, regulatory frameworks incorporate ethical guidelines that can govern the design and deployment of the use of robotic and unmanned systems? Because we see more and more use, whether it's in the military, in the civilian area. So tell us, uh, how can uh, uh, regulatory frameworks incorporate these guidelines? Well, there is some guidance to be had, of course, from past uh, regulations that have gone on regarding productization of different things as well, too. Many agencies are available uh, for self-driving cars, for example. Uh, uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation and Safety Authority, uh, is involved. Uh, in the military, um, uh, there are bodies that do that. DARPA, for example, is uh, starting to uh, spin up a new program. Uh, called DARPA Asimov, uh, which is intended to uh, incorporate ethics with uh, military values uh, into autonomous systems. Um, and uh, there are also other, apart from leveraging existing regulatory bottles, there, uh, bodies, there are other organizations. I don't know if uh, you've encountered folks from the IEEE Standards Association and their Global Initiative on Intelligent and Autonomous Systems, which is been one of the more successful, I would venture, uh, I have had some part in that, uh, efforts to try and bring together multidisciplinary perspectives, uh, international perspectives, to try and create soft law or guidelines as a basis for uh, moving forward and informing people as to the correct uh, and incorrect way uh, to consider the development of artificial intelligence and robotics. So you just talked about the international aspect, just to follow up on your point. Are there international collaborations happening towards some of these standards and regulations, or, or how can regulations facilitate such collaboration, uh, Professor? Well, again, that's obviously hard, especially as ethics in general uh, has a cultural dependency and different people have different perspectives. Uh, in the East, there's a whole lot uh, in Japan and Korea uh, like there's a whole lot, this is for the human robot side of things, a whole lot more tolerance for understanding uh, how these agents, these intelligent agents can become a part of someone's life. Uh, there's more worry uh, in the West, which dates back to the Frankenstein syndrome and the like as well, where people are fearful uh, of what uh, may happen. That uh, uh, changes the perspective. But there are efforts. Uh, one of the big efforts, of course, uh, which you've probably encountered in your uh, talks in the past, uh, is the United Nations uh, Convention on uh, Certain convention, uh, certain Weapon Systems as well, too, uh, the CCW, trying to uh, figure out ways internationally to regulate 
these systems as they uh, move forward, which are potentially very dangerous if not used appropriately, whatever that may mean. Uh, so uh, there are bodies, the World Economic Forum has been having uh, consistently meetings over the last uh, many years, I don't know exactly how many, uh, to discuss how to create uh, methods to uh, harness uh, AI uh, without, as you said, stifling innovation. It's a really challenging problem because uh, you want to move forward, but you don't want to move forward too fast. Uh, and there are principles such as the precautionary principle uh, from ethics, which talks about making sure that you have an understanding before you release the product into the wild, so to speak, of the potential harm uh, that it can, and not release it before it is uh, ready. So there are many different bodies. Uh, many are local as well too. The EU has been developing guidelines. I think there are meant 80 different versions or more uh, consistently of what is the right way to do it, going all the way back to Isaac Asimov. Uh, and Mike and his three or actually four laws uh, of robotics. Uh, so how that gets created is not a problem because 20 years ago when I first got into this, there was very few voices, almost uh, just a few of us were talking about the potential impact of uh, this technology as it moves forward. Uh, but now there's almost a cacophony uh, of voices because everyone is worried about it. Everyone is uh, differentially creating their different guidelines and principles uh, to move forward. And that doesn't necessarily lead to a consensus approach. So, uh, but it's better that people are talking about it than not. Well, that's very helpful, uh, Professor. That kind of leads me to a two part question. One is this, I mean, at least especially a little over a year, there's just been this frenzy over uh, large language models, chat, GPT, BARD, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and people have kind of forgotten a little bit about robotics and its use of AI. And now, uh, you know, the EU, the EU AI Act, and there are 100 bills in Congress talking about deep fakes and others. So, you know, uh, should we not consider robots in there? Uh, that's uh, a, a big, big consideration that we are trying to see. And also, people are, a lot of people are talking that robotics are going to have a chat GPT moment very, very soon. So I wanted to kind of just get some quick uh, feedback from you on those two points. Sure. Well, you have to keep in mind that robotics is basically the embodiment, a physical embodiment of artificial intelligence. There's a lot of stuff that's uh, going back to the broader definition of robotics that is hard automation, uh, which have any intelligence at all uh, to speak of, uh, and is very helpful, but still creates ethical questions regarding unemployment as it puts people out of dangerous, dirty, and dull uh, kinds of tasks. But uh, robotics manifests artificial intelligence in a physical way in the real world. So ChatGPT, the ability of human robot interaction that will obviously i you know i i am really impressed at how far alexa for example who i rely on daily to tell me what the tides are where i am or the weather or how my sports teams uh, are doing and really has a good grasp not great grasp but good grasp of natural language and can also generate that work and large language models now with a generative approach uh you're right that's going to uh affect robotics, uh, as well as the perception side of things and learning. Um, LLMs are basically, uh, with anywhere there's large, massive amounts of data, um, you can affect the performance of these systems in ways that are quite uh, surprising. And this, so there has been a major paradigm shift and that's working its way in. We just had a, uh, a paper uh, that we uh, uh, put in a, I can't remember which conference uh, it was in, but it was uh, talking uh, about LLMs and uh, from an ethics perspective, and we, you know, we basically asked them ethical questions and tried to see if there was a consensus because that, there, there is no understanding in LLMs of what's going on. There is zero, they don't know anything, uh, but people attribute intelligence uh, to them uh, and provide an easy to use interface. So it's, uh, it's a bit frightening how, uh, how susceptible uh, 
people are. And having worked with companies like Sony and Samsung on uh, physical robots like Ibo, which was the robot dog uh, that they have uh, generated, uh, it's uh, easy to see how, once you understand and study human psychology, how it can be exploited, how you can tap into that and uh, create uh, artifacts that have an effective relationship with people. So uh, all these things uh, are uh, crucially important, and LLMs will only exacerbate that uh, as they create the appearance of intelligence more and more for these systems. Yeah. So you, you obviously talked about the measure of ignorance. So if that is the case, then what mechanism should be established uh, within regulations to make sure that there is oversight and compliance with uh, ethical standards in the development of some of these systems, Professor? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I'm kind of a proponent uh, of Lawrence Lessig's forces, a professor at Harvard, uh, talks uh, about four different ways, I use this in my classes as well too, that you can control the way in which people interact uh, with things in the world. Uh, there's legislative, which you folks are focused on as well, too, the creating of laws, hard regulations. There's economic. I mean, you can price things out so that people can't afford it or tax them or tariff them uh, to uh, uh, some extreme level where they become regulated through that. Uh, there's social stigma. Uh, smoking, for example, is a classic example of, there. yeah, there's legislation, but if people light up a cigarette, uh, even outside right now, uh, there's pressure on them to uh, stop using that. And of course, technological changes and advance as well too, ways in which technology can be put to use to do that. So there's many, many, many different mechanisms apart from legislation which can uh, uh, guide things. But the real question is not just creating legislation, but legislation that has force. Uh, so how do you enforce these things? And I know you folks are interested in uh, the ways in which that's done. What are the appropriate penalties uh, uh, for this? Uh, if there are. And uh, the issues of social justice as well, too, uh, Rawlsian ethics, if you will. Uh, how do you ensure that the technology is available uh, to all those who have a potential need for it uh, as well, too? This is very common in healthcare and robotics uh, technology for healthcare. Uh, the EU is very concerned with ensuring that. So there's many, many different aspects uh, associated with uh, managing this. Um, and also, the probably the deepest question is whose ethics are you putting into the system, right? I mean, uh, someone has to make fundamental decisions regarding what is right and wrong, and that gets codified into legislation at some point in time. And eventually, uh, you may outgrow that, or it may become immoral, or it may have been immoral from the beginning uh, as well, too, as deemed later in history or by other subgroups. How do you, how do you manage? How do you manage that? Uh, challenging, not just for AI, but for legislation uh, in general, whether it be abortion or smoking uh, or gun control, all these different things. How do you decide what's right and wrong? And how are you going to do that for artificial intelligence? Well, the best way I would say is to have solid discussion and solid debate from many, many different points of view and see if you can converge uh, on some fundamental principles that we can agree upon. No, those are great points, uh, Professor. So uh, do you think uh, we can have uh, mandatory testing and certification processes or we can have regulations around that that verify the ethical compliance of these robotic and unmanned systems before they're deployed in various applications? Uh, mandatory is a strong word uh, okay. as well. And I would say it depends, it depends on... Uh, uh, the uh, domain in which you're talking about. In the military, there are very strict uh, requirements before, even in the early stages of development of new weapons technology, for example, Article 14, I think it's called, but I, I'm not sure, um, where you have to show that the technology that you have uh, or are or proposing to create is consistent with uh, international humanitarian law, which are the Ge Geneva Conventions, the Hague Conventions, uh, and the like. So those are pretty tightly regulated, and major defense contractors are heavily required, at least in our country, can't say for all countries, but in our countries, 
uh, to adhere to the underlying principles. Now, I was involved in some recent consulting work uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, safety requirements for autonomous vehicles, uh, cars, those that are driving around on roads today as taxis and the like. And yeah, exactly. That is basically currently self-policing. Uh, that's not to say that the companies that are doing it aren't developing and using good practices to understand uh, the safety associated and the risks associated with that uh, and moving cautiously forward. But uh, it's a little worrisome potentially because especially in high tech, there is a constant pressure to move technology out the door uh, because it's not just how good it is to be candid, it's how fast it gets to the marketplace. And that is what often captures market share. So there is potential tension and compromise that may occur uh, to, I'll say ethical considerations, maybe or maybe not safety considerations, but hopefully not, uh, um, as not only self-driving cars, but almost any form of technology. Uh, uh, look at what happened with Facebook and other things as well too. Uh, all these things with uh, uh, social media uh, and the like, it's very, uh, there's risk associated with it. So how can you put the brakes on it to say, don't move forward uh, uh, without a company losing its competitive edge? Very, very hard and challenging to do. It's the, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's the uh, stifling innovation and uh, risking as other nations, which may have less uh, regulations uh, imposed upon them in these other domains, uh, how they can move forward and faster and capture the market and leave the other countries uh, behind. It's, it's really challenging. Yeah. Uh, Professor, let's uh, talk about robot emotions, which you have uh, worked on quite a bit. So with the advancement in robotics that are obviously enabling uh, you know, the development of emotionally expressive robots, what kind of considerations should be uh, there in the regulatory frameworks to make sure that there is a responsible design and ethical use um, in the emotional capabilities of robots? Yeah. First, I, I need to mention uh, mm -hmm. that robots do not possess emotions. They are not, they do not possess them, but they can may, be made to appear to possess emotions. And I've, as I mentioned, I've worked with companies uh, and have multiple patents on, quote, I like to use scare quotes, uh, uh, robot emotions uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for that. Uh, the dangers associated with that is it's inherently deceptive, right? I mean, can you think, or the robot is making you think uh, that it's happy or it's sad? Uh, and any AI can do that. It's uh, LLM can do that. Uh, Alexa can do that. You can ask it all kinds of questions and it'll try and convey uh, some internal state of emotions uh, that it may have. Uh, this aspect of deception, uh, AI deception and robot deception, I've been working on for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years in a variety of different domains uh, as and always incorporate uh, considerations for the ethical uh, aspect of that and the discussions associated uh, with that in my publications and work uh, and talks, which I've given around the world uh, on that. But the, you know, the question is, is it appropriate uh, to allow someone, even if it makes them feel better, it makes them feel good because this robot can make you feel like it's a real companion. Is that ethically appropriate? Uh, well, it boils down to some degree on which school of ethics you uh, uh, adhere to. If you're a consequentialist, uh, you base things on outcomes. If it makes people happy, isn't that a good thing, right? Uh, there are others that are what are called deontologists or right-based or Kantians uh, who argue that there is a fundamental right for people to perceive the world as it is. And if you are deceiving them, it is inherently wrong. Uh, I've had large debates, uh, both in print and in person, uh, with other philosophers, and uh, this has brought me deep into the philosophy uh, community, um, that I tend to fall on the side of consequentialism in most of my work as well, too. Uh, outcomes are better. If I can save uh, civilian lives, for example, in warfare, to me, that is a crucial component, and the outcome of existing war 
with damage to civilians is un, utterly intolerable. intolerable. Uh, but others argue that uh, there is a fundamental right uh, for people not to be killed by robots. Uh, and uh, how do you balance these perspectives? How do you do these sorts of things? And the same thing uh, relies for uh, much, many, many uh, domains. Same thing for unemployment. If we can do the jobs better and help certain stakeholders, uh, isn't that a good thing? Uh, but then again, don't people have a fundamental right to uh, have a dull, dirty, or dangerous job if it provides them with a family uh, and an income that they would not have if a robot uh, replaces this and takes away their happiness from that sense? Uh, what's right and what's wrong? Uh, and I tend to not be prescriptive in saying what's right and what's wrong. As an ethicist, we explore the different moral codes as opposed to prescribe and say, this is the right one and this is the wrong one. And so we try and find ways in which to imbue robots, if you will, with different ethical frameworks. And we're just finishing up some work that we've done for the National Science Foundation, uh, studying that problem specifically uh, from both expert ethicists and what we call folk morality, what people actually think is right and wrong, which is not based on ethical, formal ethical frameworks. So just to make sure I understand, are you for having a regulatory framework that would ensure ethical use of uh, the emotional capabilities of robots? Or you think that's not possible? I think it's possible. Indeed, in the IEEE, I headed up the affective uh, group under the IEEE Global Initiative on Autonomous Systems. And we came up with a couple of guidelines associated with that. Uh, one is uh, whether you should opt in, opt out, or no way out uh, for the use of this technology. It's like informed consent. Uh, you should be made aware and that does not necessarily mean you get all that boilerplate every time you download a new app or something like that says, do you agree uh, to this? And it's 50 pages long and uh, sure, I agree, but I'm not sure exactly what I agreed to uh, in, in this particular case. So you have to make a decision like that. That was one of the things that we talked about. And the other one is we talked about potential certification uh, when deception is used and under in what circumstances it could be right. We said it's good for, potentially good for the uh, a guideline said, when it benefits the other person, it's called other deception, when it leads to their betterment uh, and their advantage, which a deception can help with in a variety of different circumstances, uh, but it can also be used maliciously. Uh, and so having that and having a regulatory body to be able to certify the technology before it goes to market would be very, very helpful. How to do that and how to implement that uh, is outside of my pay grade, I guess, all too. But I can be a voice in helping that. So, just to follow on uh, that question towards human robot interaction, uh, what uh, regulatory frameworks or legislative measures do you believe are necessary to safeguard, you know, just the privacy user rights in terms of deployment of robots? Yeah. Uh, the privacy, of course, is a crucial issue, but it's no different. Uh, in many respects, other than the fact that if you have a robot companion, it is with you potentially all the time. Uh, and imagine you had a robot dog uh, and it did the same thing, or a cat, or it was your pet. It was actually with you all the time. It sees everything, it hears everything. Well, you don't have to worry about someone getting a core dump of your data uh, from uh, your uh, a Cocker Spaniel uh, or your Siamese. Uh, at this point in time, but someone could potentially tap into these systems or a government could mandate uh, getting access uh, to that information. Um, what's Is that appropriate and under uh, what different types of circumstances? And this, there is a trend as well too to something uh, that people don't spend much time talking about because it's kind of a, a yuck factor uh, discussion. It's a notion of robot intimacy uh, and the fact that we are going to have ultimately, uh, should we should we not destroy ourselves uh, in the interim, um, real companions, which could be uh, partners in every level of uh, human robot interaction. And uh, what are we, are we gonna allow that? Are we gonna legislate against that? Are we going to control it? I'm worried about it because it, it can potentially seriously affect the social fabric and the way in which we relate with each other. If you had, for example, a robot lover that is better than any lover 
that you've ever had or ever will have, uh, is what's that going to do? Uh, so how do we manage this technology? And people, unfortunately, as it's being created, uh, and it is being created, uh, often turn a blind eye to it because they don't want to talk about it. And that's one area I think that's second on my list of priorities behind uh, uh, lethal autonomous weapons is the robot intimacy aspects and the harm. Uh, and there is real harm that could potentially- The societal harm. Uh, exactly. And individual uh, harm as well too. Yeah, I mean, but the, the argument is that we have a crisis of loneliness also in this country, but uh, you know, that's- and especially. Uh, yeah. Um, so let's just say, uh, Professor, you know, some of these companies who are producing these robots and, you know, it's going to just uh, with technology, the processing power, it's going to get uh, more and more widespread, just like LLMs. If, uh, if there are some ethical lapses uh, by, uh, uh, you know, some of these robots, what kind of uh, liability frameworks within regulations can form these people responsible? Uh, again, I would probably say product safety regulations. I mean, we see doors blowing out of uh, uh, airplanes uh, right now as well, too. Um, there's all kinds of stuff regarding industrial regulation of the technology. In the military, uh, of course, there's laws that exist uh, that have been agreed upon uh, that are widespread. Uh, uh, how that gets attributed in the chain of responsibility uh, becomes a little more complicated uh, in that. Uh, is it the person who deployed the system? Is it the person that used the system? Is it the uh, commanding officer that allowed it to occur? Is it the product company uh, that built the system, uh, but it was built to appropriate specs and certified? Uh, was it the scientist who came up with the idea? How do you, uh, how do you attribute responsibility? And Unfortunately, and the same for autonomous cars and the like as well too, which is probably a closer uh, issue right now. I believe that the answers to these questions will be found in the courtroom. Uh, it's, I, it, I don't care what you legislate. I think uh, it's, the, the law is gonna be educated somewhere as to uh, what's acceptable uh, all the way up the uh, judicial chain uh, at some point, should they have room in their agenda to be able to do it given what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Professor, you said that DARPA has something like a ethics review board. Uh, should there be regulations to ma mandate these kind of review boards for the specific applications of robotics and unmanned technologies? Well, there are many uh, uh, review boards, even within companies as well, too. Okay. Uh, for uh, robots so and unmanned systems. Yeah, for AI and robots and all those things as well, too. I mean, uh, there's hard to separate AI AI robotics uh, and the like. I'm not talking about uh, hard automation type of robotic systems as well, too. And those are clearly governed by uh, uh, OSHA and other things as well, too, which are the organizations uh, that do with it. It's when the smarts start getting into the system and the ability for people to start thinking that they're smart uh, that we run uh, into trouble. Uh, but many companies have this to guide uh, the development uh, I've worked uh, with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, trying to develop uh, uh, courses and principles uh, by which they can uh, uh, educate uh, industry uh, as to what is in a good way and an appropriate way, a development cycle that you could potentially use. Uh, there are, uh, having a bunch of people though, doesn't make a board successful. Uh, and the real issue is, is it in lip service only, or it does it have uh, real meat? Uh, and I fear the former rather than the latter uh, for, for much of this. And uh, uh, we've seen boards disbanded because they came up with the wrong answer uh, uh, for uh, whatever reason. Um, I, well, I'm trying to think of the company that we just had. Uh, it was the, the gentleman who was fired his employees protested, and he just recently- uh, Oh, OpenAI. OpenAI, yeah, you saw what happened there. Uh, I don't know the gory details of that. I was concerned about how that uh, technology was being released. I was not involved in any of the discussions directly with it, but I was surprised uh, that it was moving forward uh, with people given the ability to evidently create their own versions of ChatGPT, local versions, uh, 
uh, that worried me uh, somewhat. And uh, I don't know what the boardroom meetings were like that led to his initial demise and then the uprising that caused uh, the reversal of that and the disbanding of the board. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, situation. Uh, and uh, boards can certainly communicate their concerns, but they do not necessarily get acted upon. And I'm not saying that that was the, the correct or incorrect case in that instance. I don't know enough about it, but it was an interesting data point. Yeah. So uh, just to kind of follow up, uh, on that point, uh, you know, you talk about obviously uh, your concern is about some of these technologies you're referring to agents and things of that nature. Uh, and there is a lot of talk of open sourcing robots too. Are you against open sourcing or you prefer, uh, I mean, the discussion on open sourcing is now raging very heavily for LLMs, but it could be the same thing with robots too. Open sourcing, uh, the same, this, if this, we're referring to the software, is a very wise strategy uh, overall because it allows others to inspect uh, the code and understand how it was developed. Uh, so the, the deeper question, especially for LLMs, is data. Uh, often the data can't be open sourced uh, as easy because some of it is proprietary um, and also open sourcing because of intellectual property uh, uh, rights, uh, companies want to preserve uh, their software that they spent in many cases, millions and millions of dollars sometimes developing. Uh, so uh, open source is a really important uh, aspect uh, uh, for the sharing of software and software development in general. Uh, but again, it creates attention uh, as, as well between stifling innovation and discouraging people to uh, move uh, forward. Uh, and also uh, it creates potential liability after the fact, but it creates also potential opportunity for others to see vulnerability in the software as well. So uh, Professor, let's uh, just shift for a minute to talk about uh, workforce and employment. Uh, about, let's say about maybe two weeks ago, the IMF came out with a report and there have been various reports by McKenzie and others, but IMF report was uh, pretty stark and it was quite a bit focused, I would say on LLMs, but they talked about AI, uh, where there could be job losses in industrialized countries up to 60%, let's say in the US uh, or changes, et cetera. Now, obviously heavy focus on them was the application of uh, large language models or Gen AI. Uh, but you could argue that robotics uh, could, you know, white press use of robotics could have a pretty severe implication in terms of jobs and as you talked about societal implications. Uh, what are your thoughts and should regulators be thinking about that? I mean, we talk, there's a lot of conversation going about for Gen AI in terms of reskilling our population, the workforce, uh, Biden uh, executive order talks about that. but. And nobody's talked about the application of robotics and its impact on workforce, at least from a regulatory standpoint. Yeah, well, actually, the discussion of robotics predates LLMs by a decade, uh, as well, too. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the public fear... memory is very short in this town. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, for the fear, yeah. the fear of unemployment is very real, uh, and I agree that unemployment changes are likely to be massive. Uh, I don't know if 60% is the right number. LLMs threaten white collar jobs a whole lot more uh, than blue collar jobs that robotics. Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, you can see uh, robotic guides and other things as well too, apart from just in industrial applications, which have already displaced uh, tremendous numbers uh, of workers over the year. What's interesting also is, again, with the Screen Actors Guild and other things as well, too, uh, we're concerned with avatars, if you will, uh, creating and stealing their body image and their language model um, and the like uh, as well, too. And who owns that and who gets royalties uh, from those sorts of things? Good question. Um, I have spoken to congressional aides and the like uh, in the past, and I've interacted with the military and the Pentagon and other places over the years uh, as well, too. Uh, listen, move forward cautiously. Slow is not necessarily bad, uh, but 
try and recognize the fact that this technology will move forward, uh, if not in this country, somewhere else. Uh, the burdens, I'm rereading the executive order from the White House, uh, that's quite a burden uh, on government to be able to do all those things that are listed in there in that short time frame. But organizations that you have, such as NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and, uh, and Technology, I guess, I, I, anyway, yeah, um, that are resources that you should use. Uh, I have worked with those people in the past. They are uh, historically wonderful uh, people and could give guidance. The people that you've had in OSTP, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, very solid. Uh, I respect them uh, greatly. Um, but be careful and be able to change, I guess, is the key. Uh, recognize that some laws may work effectively uh, at this moment, uh, but they may need to be hardened or softened uh, in the future as well, too. So that's my final, uh, final words, I guess, I can leave with them. It's extremely challenging. So to me, uh, finding ways to reduce the harm that people will suffer as this technology moves forward is crucial. And that is from both an educational perspective as well as an economic perspective, I would contend. So, uh, Professor, last week I was at CES and there was robotics all over the place. I mean, they had robotics for senior care, taking care of, you know, elder, a, a robot taking care of elder care in just a massive number. And uh, I can tell you, uh, the larger proportion of companies that were displaying it were actually out from outside the U.S. in many cases. Uh, so obviously, uh, it is coming and it will have an impact on society. Again, from a societal standpoint, now there is going to be positives as we have an aging population. So maybe there is a benefit uh, for that. Uh, and as you said, uh, there has to be something done from a regulatory uh, standpoint. But talking about, are there any human rights uh, implications? I mean, should regulations mandate some human rights impact assessments for deployment of robotic and unmanned systems? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned, the notion of deception and creative robots that make people feel better but they understand that they do not have life or they do not have agency and they think that uh, there isn't there a fundamental human right to perceive the world as it is. Uh, you talked about uh, the UN, uh, look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights as well too, as, as a good starting point, which uh, talks about the right to privacy. It talks about uh, the right to food and education and all these other things as well too. How can the technology be used in ways uh, to accomplish that? Is it all about making uh, people rich uh, or is it enriching people's lives? Uh, and I would prefer it to be the latter, uh, however defined. Uh, and uh, I think that's where we need to pay significant attention to. And the UN Charter uh, on the Declaration of Human Rights, I think, is a good place to begin. And there's, I, been in a bunch of meetings where uh, that does serve as the basis uh, for uh, a starting point uh, for these uh, discussions. So, Professor, uh, to what extent should public consultation be uh, involved and integrated into creating uh, ethical regulations for robotic and unmanned systems, and specifically divorce perspectives, not the usual perspectives? Uh, good question again. Uh, the NSF program uh, that we are uh, just finishing up, uh, we uh, got the public perspective using SurveyMonkey. Uh, uh, I believe it was that. I can't remember which one. Uh, but we gathered public opinion uh, regarding what is right and what is wrong regarding a variety of different scenarios uh, and the use of uh, a robot, uh, such as um, pill sorting for the elderly, speaking of elder care. Uh, the thing is, I uh, the, uh, this is I, we did work earlier in early stage Parkinson's where this is a crucial issue and if people make mistakes in sorting pills into the containers, uh, it can end up doing very very serious harm uh, to them. So how do you train these people if it happens uh, to be a robot? Uh, is it okay to give false encouragement uh, to them during the training to keep them engaged, which often teachers do 
you know, you're doing great, Johnny, uh, but maybe you're not doing so great, but you want to stay, keep them engaged. Is that ethically appropriate uh, to be able to do that? And then we, uh, that's what we call the high risk uh, scenario. And then we looked at uh, studies, uh, if you're playing games with a, uh, a robot, like Connect4, which is what we specifically studied. Uh, is it okay uh, to uh, uh, allow uh, you to deliberately lose a game? Uh, should I lose, throw a game, uh, uh, even though it could, because it'll keep them engaged, it'll make them happy. So from time to time, should it say, is that okay? And so we wanted to get people's opinions for both a human and a robot, what is correct uh, to be able to do it. Uh, and we did that for both elderly and for uh, uh, kids uh, as well, too. Then we looked at a high-risk situation, which we only talked about doing. We didn't do it, uh, which was uh, children learning how to swim in an almost sink or swim scenario. Should you say, uh, uh, I'll catch you, I'll catch you, jump in, and don't catch them. Uh, is that ethically appropriate uh, under those circumstances? You don't let them drown, obviously, but you might force them to actually swim. Uh, uh, so we use this and we were trying to find ways to determine what is the right thing to put using what's called folk morality, what average people think is the right or wrong thing to do. How, how would you like your robot to behave uh, under those circumstances as compared to, as I mentioned, uh, ethicists who we surveyed as well too, using Kantian frameworks and consequentialist frameworks and all the different types of frameworks to say this would be the right thing uh, to do. In practice, generally, in uh, more mundane situations, don't do formal ethical analysis. They do what they think is right or wrong. And uh, for example, uh, if you're driving a car, uh, do you obey every road law to the letter of the law? Do you never go exactly over the speed limit? Do you always come to a full stop at a stop sign? Uh, and so on. Uh, what do you want your autonomous vehicle to do? Uh, do you want it to behave the letter of the law? And there have been instances which have shown when a car came, an autonomous vehicle came to a full stop at a stop sign, it was rear-ended because the people behind it thought it would uh, uh, keep going. Uh, if you allow your car to go over the speed limit, uh, who gets a ticket? Uh, and all these kinds of issues. Or if it gets in an accident as a violation of that. Many, many different questions. But just because people do it, should robots do it too? That's that's the question we have to uh, uh, wrestle with. So I hope that answered the question, but I, I think about that. Uh, Professor, you talked about autonomous vehicles quite a bit. So just a question uh, for our audience. There may be 100,000 uh, accidental deaths that happen every year. Uh, there was... Cruise, which is a was a subsidiary, is a subsidiary of GM. Their car uh, had a major accident with somebody on the hood, and um, that happened. Uh, obviously, the consequences of that were the CEOs left. Now, Cruise is kind of out of business in the sense they folded back in. Uh, it, how do you uh, figure that out? Uh, ultimately, the benefits of an autonomous vehicle could be saving hundreds of thousands of lives. Now, you know, every life is very, very important. And obviously, this was a horrifying accident. But basically, a company that had spent billions and billions of dollars is kind of marched completely back. Now, obviously, Waymo is still out there with its robocars, et cetera. What are your thoughts on something like this? Well, don't forget Tesla as well, too, and the number of people that have died in self-driving mode uh, in Tesla uh, as well. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I tend to come down as a consequentialist, uh, which means that if it can be shown and it is proven, uh, best as you can prove uh, these sorts of things, that it will have a net saving of human life, uh, then I believe it is worth uh, deploying. Uh, but how do you do this? That's the safety question. This is the safety practices that we were uh, we were evaluating, as I mentioned uh, uh, before. Are these effective and adequate? I think the goal of most self-driving car programs is just that, to reduce uh, human harm. Uh, but there are secondary and tertiary effects uh, of these systems 
It can induce road rage in others if it's going too slow and uh, they may get into accidents. At least there's no driver to shoot in a self-driving car. So that's, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to fire at them. Uh, but uh, there's a variety of different things that uh, can go wrong. And one of the interesting things uh, was that as these systems go forward, there's what are called known unknowns, which are the things we really don't know what's going to happen uh, if this occurs. But the bigger threat are the unknown unknowns, which are the ones that keep showing up, although these companies have had millions of miles of road experience on that, and they've learned from that. There are still instances that will come up uh, that they couldn't have even imagined and did not even imagine. Um, and uh, fortunately, in general, uh, the loss of, and this is very cavalier of me, the loss of life could be significantly less under those circumstances than would be with human drivers, which are prone to uh, road rage and drunken driving and lack of attention and all the other things that cause accidents uh, apart from uh, uh, randomness. But people expect these cars to be perfect. And that's not going to happen. That is plain and simple not going to happen. So if you are going to make the bar so high that it approaches perfection, you might as well stop uh, considering the building of these particular systems, at least in this country. I think other countries may move forward, but uh, uh, I believe in uh, trying the benchmark of saving human life and reducing casualties uh, is significant. And uh, that's not to say that when an accident does occur and harm occurs to an individual, that they are not, they are liable, they are, Recourse, recourse to uh, lawyering and the like should be available to them. And uh, there are standards that companies have used to evaluate how much a human life is worth regarding recalls and the like from a, a, a financial perspective. Uh, so they uh, assess the risk uh, of these sorts of things, which again is sounds difficult and sounds hard and uh, inhumane to think of people in terms of dollars. But often consequentialism uh, boils down uh, to that as well, too. But from a deontological perspective, a rights-based perspective, there is a fundamental principle, and probably the one that trumps all, is the right to life uh, for a human being and the right to a good quality of life. And how can we uh, protect that? Um, so how do you move forward? At what time pace? How do you do it financially? All really challenging problems, but I don't believe in stifling uh, the advancement of technology, but regulating it, which is what you guys are all about, is just the right thing to do. Well, that's very, very helpful. Uh, finally, uh, Professor, this has been uh, amazingly in insightful. Our audience, in many cases, is made up of members of Congress, Senate, think tanks, their staff. Uh, any final words for them as they are slowly, uh, in this town, we do things slow, slow, slow. But as they slowly advance towards regulation, legislation, uh, uh, your voice to them. Good question. Um, I have spoken to congressional aides and the like uh, in the past, and I've interacted with the military and the Pentagon and other places over the years uh, as well, too. Uh, listen, move forward cautiously. Slow is not necessarily bad, uh, but try and recognize the fact that this technology will move forward, uh, if not in this country, somewhere else. Uh, the burdens, I'm rereading the executive order from the White House, uh, that's quite a burden uh, on government to be able to do all those things that are listed in there in that short time frame. But organizations that you have, such as NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and, uh, and Technology, I guess, I, I, anyway, yeah, um, that are resources that you should use. Uh, I have worked with those people in the past. They are uh, historically wonderful uh, people and could give guidance. The people that you've had in OSTP, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, very solid. Uh, I respect them uh, greatly. Um, but be careful and be able to change, I guess is the key. Uh, recognize that some laws may work effectively uh, at this moment, uh, but they may need to be hardened or softened uh, in the future as well, too. So that's my final, uh, final words, I guess I can leave with them. Well, 
thank you so much. Your final words will be sent to them. It's a real pleasure and an honor to have you. Some great insights on uh, future technologies and the current technologies. So thank you for being here, Professor. It's a pleasure, Sanjay. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Regulating AI Innovate Responsibly podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on the show. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review.